Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands-on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for March 6th, 2022. Uh, the readings are Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11, Psalm 91, 1 and 2, then 9 through 16, Romans 10, 8b through 13, and Luke uh, 4, 1 through 13, the traditional reading of uh, the testing of Jesus the first Sunday of Lent. Always the temptation testing of Jesus. And uh, it is a the Lucan version. So I think it's always helpful to pay attention to those differences of how, uh, how we have, uh, how it's unique to Luke. And a couple of things I would highlight uh, is the order of the temptations. Uh, we've got uh, the bread and the uh, and the last. Oh well, no, not the first one. The first one is yes. The first one's bread, right? Yes, yeah. it is. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, and, and so we got bread is... temple, bread temple, uh, mountain, and then in Luke we have temp, we have bread, mountain temple, and so we might want to think about that. And uh, and of, but the first thing I want to start out with is full of the Holy Spirit which is, uh, you know, you have led by in both Matthew and, and Luke, but full of the Holy Spirit. And the way in which that uh, becomes also an important uh, thing for us to think about that, how this is not, how the temptation, I think it's so easy for the temptation of Jesus to be an observer and say, woo, Jesus, way to go. You, you did it, you know, rock on Jesus, you can do this. And, and yet, how is it that we are, uh, how is it that that this foreshadows, of course, not only Jesus' temptation again in Jerusalem uh, on the Mount of Olives and his prayer to let this cup pass, uh, but also how it, uh, once you are filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, indeed, that that leads you into trials and to and and testings. Uh, that will be true for John the Baptist, uh, and that and that of course becomes also true for. Um, it, Jesus, I mean, it's true for Jesus followers. So it's a, it, it's a, I think the first thing to think about is how do we go into this with that kind of stance, that this is not just, uh, you know, rah, rah, Jesus, but uh, how is it this a reflection of some of our own uh, trials and temptations in our life of following Jesus? And what are some of the things that, uh, that we, that we draw on or that we rely on or that steady us or that, get us through uh, those realities. And I think we're given some uh, perspective on that as well. And the first one is being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I'll just start there, throw that out and uh, see what we think. And that filling is not just, a, like you said, an injection of courage or um, a strong sense of who he is or confidence. It's something that happens to his body. It happens to his whole self, which I think it's worth talking about because there's something so visceral about some of these temptations in particular the hunger uh, as well where we're told he's famished you know that he that, that part of the trial is i don't think it's a mastery of his body this is not soul over body or something like that but it's to think about the ways in which um 
he himself experiences the tests in an embodied way. Um, again, it's not like he has a vision where he has to think his way out of it. And so even the pain, uh, the suffering that's part of it, even the exhilaration and the joy, perhaps when it's over, the text doesn't narrate that, but uh, there are things like the, 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 third temp, the third test has to do with threats to his body and the idea of uh, if God is truly faithful, you will be kept secure. We know at the end of the story, it doesn't quite work out exactly that way. So might be something worth talking about there. A, a lot of theology is trying to correct for ways in which the body's been overlooked with regard to faith and worship and glorifying God. But there's also ways in which testing and, and struggle are as well very much embodied things. I don't know where to go with that in the sermon. It just uh, struck me this year that it deserves some attention. Can you be caught um, uh, in this parable uh, or, or this as a parallel uh, to uh, the story of the fall? Um, and uh, I want to, um, uh, I should say, as I began this, I want to say, Lord, give me that kind of faith. Um, it's, um, it's how I would start this text, how I started as I began to look at it. And um, the parallel would be the proposition, if, if what God says is true, then prove yourself. Not point to God, which, but as Jesus did, Jesus chooses to say, let me point you to what God is saying here. And, and then the counter proposition, which is, um, I know the word as well as you do. So here's one, God makes the promise and I can give you this. And Jesus replies, it's already mine. I don't need you to act like it came from you. And then the final offer, uh, which is show me your trust that, that, that you really trust in God as if, this whole, as if this whole encounter isn't a demonstration that, God, that Jesus is trusting God. Um, and I began saying that I would start this with this, uh, or that I started this with this sort of sense of, wow, I really want that kind of faith. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that as um, uh, some type of uh, flashy healing or blessing, but more the steadfast day-to-day -day journey. Um, I think of Kate Bowler's um, Everything Happens uh, and the stories that she's telling from that, or the her own story that she narrates in the book by that title, um, or um, uh, going back a little bit in history, the the story of the village of uh, La Chambon and how how the people just um, to use the word I would say filled with the spirit acted in this way, and when asked why did you do this or how could you do this, it it was it wasn't oh, I figured out that this was the right answer. It, it's just, Matt, to use your word, in my body, in my being, this is how I respond. And then I come back around, Lord, I want that kind of faith. I think too, uh, you know, when we think about that, that kind of faith and where do we, where do we get that or what, on what do we rely, Joy? I, you know, a couple of other things about this passage that, that we that a preacher might lift up is, you know, that that truth of the Holy Spirit, which I, I love that, Matt, about that embodied sense of what that feels like and how you respond in that. But there are a couple of other sort of hidden promises, if you will, <laughs> in this passage that I think uh, I wonder if Jesus relied on. Uh, and the the first is that just the interesting narrative location of this that uh, right before, of course, the temptation in Luke is uh, the uh, genealogy of Jesus, whereas in Matthew, it's, you know, at the beginning of the, his gospel. And, and so that sort of sense of moving into this with a, with a, a, a truth of who he is and where he has come from, uh, which, uh, which then you go back to Mary and, and the Magnificat and, and just knowing that sense of, of ancestry and how that is um, um, empowering and uplifting and, and energizing and essential. And then also the, the truth of the promise, right, that the, in verse three, the devil doesn't say if, says since, you, since you are the son of God. And I wonder if we hear that too. Do we hear 
um, in those moments? Do we hear, well, here, you know, if you are the, if you are a child of God, you'll do this, or do we hear since, you know, since you are a child of God, and how is it that that becomes a, uh, a, a hidden promise in this that, and it may be space and place to talk about uh, those, those kinds of ways that we move through those trials uh, and temptations and testing in our lives and, and, then, and then reliance on scripture. So there's so much here that, that I think would give people uh, a sense of, yeah, what, what, what is it that carries me through? You talked about at the very beginning as well, um, Caroline, the ways in which we want to tend to the individualities of these different synoptic passages. And Luke's is the one that ends with the devil departing uh, until an opportune time, which is that kind of haunting um, promise itself that, that he's going to come back. Um, and Luke and John are the two gospels that are explicit about uh, Satan motivating Judas when it comes down to the end of the story as well. So that's, there's this interesting way in which I think Luke as a gospel is, is reminding us there's a hidden drama that's always there that you won't be able to see necessarily in all of Jesus' interactions with other people. Uh, and of course, that opportune time, assuming that the reference here is, is to Judas and then the, the betrayal and the arrest and the crucifixion, that that also is... Um, has to do with his body that also has to do with um, an opportunity perhaps to save himself that's also a place where um, the demands on him physically are so dramatic the idea of harm to his body is so dramatic the idea of what does it mean to claim a kingdom in that moment Luke's one of the gospels that says the most about kingship during the trial that it's a if nothing else this is a reminder of things to look for as people walk through luke's gospel throughout this year and that's going to get broken up by luke and easter of course but uh, you might want to flag this depending upon how good of a memory your congregation has about these are the types of things that will come back things like human need things like uh, power and authority and things like um, um, personal harm and what does it mean to trust and obey uh, as well uh, and these are the things that we're probably all susceptible to in various ways. I mean, that's, I don't want to take these three tests as somehow paradigmatic of all the temptations we ever face, because I think I can think of a lot more <laughs> that are out there, but um, certainly things that are relevant for this gospel and its message. And I think it's important that you name that, that you name that Matt that that um, that opportune time, uh, and so you get a reference to Satan for at Peter's denial, uh, where Jesus predicts Peter denial in in Luke, uh, and so that it. But it's also an important reality for us in that, yeah, this is not like a one time test, right? It's it's part of it's obedience to to God is uh, is is a constant reality of these kinds of situations. Um, and, and what is it that, what is it that, um, what, as I said earlier, what is it that helps us move forward or in that, or what is it that is present for us in that? The ongoing step-by-step -step journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that seems key, especially now where, you know, it's, or at least here in the United States, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of of the big shutdown uh, regarding COVID. And you think about ways in which um, we've lived in our own kind of cultural tests and, and our own frustration. I thought we already dealt with that, right? I thought we already passed this test. I thought we already mastered that temptation. And um, right, that's one of the, maybe the the flaws of this is a yay Jesus thing. If this is, you know, he does this once and then he's done. Mm -hmm. um, and now the devil leaves him alone or something or, or self-doubt leaves forever or whatever. Um, I'd like to see more of that in the story because I have to believe it's part of it, yeah. part of the experience. One thing that um, captures my attention about the passage in addition to um, what you all have been sharing is um, the, that when Jesus comes to you know, undo sin, um, there's gonna be no compromise with evil. Um, and that part, the good news is that um, in uh, in the work in Christ's work to redeem all of us from the power of sin, what Luther calls sin, death, and the devil, uh, or sin ourselves, our sinful selves, death, and the devil, 
um, Christ will brook no compromise uh, in order to win uh, our lives for us. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, I'm willing to compromise a lot. You know what I mean? I'm almost always willing to compromise uh, if, if it means an easier road for myself. And uh, obviously, that's not uh, what Jesus does. Want a completely different text? Completely different sensibility? Would that be Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 26. <laughs> this is my favorite passage in Deuteronomy, I think. Wow. Um, I love I love that it's a liturgy, um, even though I don't, um, and I've never been accused of loving liturgy, but this is a little liturgy. And uh, the, the, the development in the liturgy, it starts off a wandering Aramean was my ancestor, referring to Jacob, uh, who went down to Egypt and lived there as a sojourner, as an alien. Then it says that uh, uh, he became a great nation, mighty and populous, um, hearkening to the promise to, to Abraham and Sarah. And then it says the Egyptians treated us, we, and then uh, narrates the Exodus story. And then it says, so now I bring the first fruits of the ground. So that in this narrative liturgy, the story of Israel is uh, re-narrated very crisply so that it becomes, it goes from he to we to I. Uh, and in the act of worship, in the act of bringing a sacrifice, a gift. Um, the worshiper uh, becomes liturgically part of the people, part of the promised people. It's Joseph, right? You meant you said Jacob. I just want to make sure I didn't miss. No, it's Jacob because mind. Jacob also goes. To, Jacob is the one, right? Who goes down? Uh, Joseph's also there, right? Okay, just making sure. Most Old Testament scholars would identify this with Jacob, but some argue Abraham because he went down there and some argue Joseph. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it's the tie that you make there because uh, in terms of recognizing the liturgy of this and um, um, that this rehearsal is a rehearsal um, of telling the story um, not as... Um, it, 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 we, don't, we don't do this for God, we do this for ourselves. And, and sometimes we, um, we think that we go through, quote unquote, these habits or these rituals because it's something God requires of us. And um, if I lean back just ever so slightly or desperately uh, to uh, the uh, Lucan passage, this is a way for us to remember who we are. Um, by telling our story. Um, um, where did we come from? Where are we going in order to recognize where we are in the, in the moment? And, uh, and when um, Caroline, both you and Matt, when you were speaking of uh, the Lucan moment, you took us back and reminded us of where we were going in order to be in the moment. And we're going back to the very beginning of our story, the story of the people of Israel, the promised ones who have a promise for the world. And this story is rehearsed, not as a God says we've got to do this, but because this is how I know who I am. This is how I can be me with integrity. Yeah, I was thinking that same thing too, Joy, in that and also what Rolf said with regard to a rehearsal of, of, of the story that then affirms identity. And that's certainly one of the issues for uh, themes in the temptation, right, is that sense of, of will Jesus live into uh, his identity as the son of God and his calling? And, uh, and how is it that we, how, and how is it that we do that? And his response, of course, to the to the temptations, uh, to the tests, uh, is to is to respond with scripture. And and what you're suggesting, and what we get in in Deuteronomy, is this. Yeah, a response is also to a story, or ancestry, or that sense of what is it that we're what's central or core 
to uh, to who we knew, know God to be and who we know ourselves to be and the way in which um, that is consistently tested uh, both individually and communally, congregationally, uh, and nationally. Uh, and that's, uh, as, as Matt said, you know, the, the anniversary coming up of two years of, of being in, in a pandemic, how much a church, how much churches and individuals have had to answer that question. What will church be? What will church look like? How do we define church? What will we what what for each and every church is their their uh, that pillar that they will uh, that they will hold on to and says no this is who we are uh, in the midst of all of the pivoting and the compromising uh, I think it's a I think it's a question uh, important question both for uh, for each and every person but also uh, perhaps for a preacher to put to a congregation as well as they as they think about their own mission and purpose and ethos and identity of who they are as a community together. One last thing before we move on, uh, at least for, uh, that I want to say, uh, you guys might have other things to add to, obviously, but is that it ends in a celebration. Um, so uh, you give the gift to the Lord, and then there's a celebration, which is, is maybe odd for, uh, to have this uh, the first Sunday in Lent when we've just had the celebration uh, before the season of fasting. But to note that the celebration then occurs that it's a celebration of the bounty and the abundance of God, uh, but you include those who have no inheritance of their own, in this case, the Levites and, uh, and then the sojourners. Okay, Psalm 91, 1 through 2, and 9 through 16. And I, I wanted to uh, start by saying uh, that I appreciated very much the commentary on the website that connected this, uh, this psalm to uh, the question about fear, the, issue, the presence of fear in our lives, which is not unrelated to temptations and testings, right? That the way in which what tempts us it has is, or what, what when our times of trials are deeply connected to um, that which we fear. Uh, and um, so I, I really appreciated that, what causes us fear and, and the way in which uh, the commentary invite us, invited us into that space and again, uh, invited. We can invite people into that space as well. Of, of what is it? What is it that they fear? What ex, what fears have they experienced in the way in which these uh, the words of the psalmist offer that refuge and fortress and shelter? I, I wasn't. I agree. I wasn't clear about one thing in the um, in the paragraph in the first paragraph, uh, first citing it Roosevelt, but then I think the next quotation might be from Walter Brueggemann, if, uh, if I read the footnotes right. You gotta have a place where you process your fears because if you don't process your fears, they will devour you, they will immobilize you. Whoever said that, uh, I just found it really helpful. It looks like it's Brueggemann, according yeah. to the footnote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, he has a few good things to say every once in a while. I don't think FDR would have said gotta. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too, Matt. I, 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 this is exactly. Um, what was your first clue? <laughs> but that was. In, go ahead, uh, Joy, please. No, it's okay, Ralph. You were. Yeah. Well, I just I found that helpful. You know <laughs> that. Um, and that's one thing that prayer can be. Then, you know, prayer can be a place where we process our fears and the the psalms of trust so often name the fears the real fears so poetically and we'll see that next week in psalm 27 um but but that pr uh, prayer can be this place for us uh where we do name our fears quite realistically to god and then um welcome god to change our hearts our own fears maybe Welcome God's changing power. It only has power if the fear is real, if the fear is consuming. Um, 
we can get to where we say these words and it's like, oh, that's my favorite Psalm. I want to repeat it because that'll make me feel better. No, when I really need to know who my shelter is, where my shelter is, where, the sh where, where I can hide, where I can be uplifted, um, um, where I am loved, um, who, who will satisfy my life. I have to feel like I'm unloved. I have to feel like the shadows are overwhelming with me. I have to feel like I am not going to last. And so I really, I also appreciated that juxtaposition of being able to pay attention to the realness of the fear in order to appreciate um, what it means to speak this, to speak it in song, to speak it in prayer, to speak it in poetry. Um, that, in, that in so many ways is what makes poetry so rich is because it comes out of very real emotions. And that's why the Psalms are, continue to sustain us because they really come in the depths of our real experiences and emotions. Well, we have this one text from Romans. We've just been in Corinthians, uh, and then we're going to be all over the place in Paul in the coming weeks. But we touched down once uh, here in Romans. Yeah, as I was reading this, I thought I'm supposed to really like this text for Lent, <laughs> but, but, it's, <laughs> but it's not working for me. Or not, you know, it's it's so uh, it's so disembodied. It's so pulled out of the larger context in Romans nine through eleven. So just to note that. So, but I wouldn't preach on that. But it's 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 theologically dense, right? It's kind of the stripped down statement of some really meaty, really central theological ideals, um, and it's which is worth talking about. The, the reason why I said I'm supposed to like this because it's all about the power of word, right? It's all about you know this is the kind of thing that's supposed to make my reformed heart sing. Um, but I do worry if it's a little bit too disembodied in some ways uh, as well as if, and, and to put that into, into pairing with, with Luke chapter four, I do worry if it makes it sound like kind of a name it and claim it, right? If you just say Jesus is Lord enough, if you just believe hard enough, everything's going to be just fine for you. Um, which go. of course isn't true, but of course it is true in some ways at the same time. And we could parse that out but i don't know i just would want to talk about how this is something that individuals do this is also something that communities strive to do and there's something creedal i would perhaps try to preach this alongside the deuteronomy text and talk about the power of a community holding a story or holding a confession and trust and how that pulls you forward in times of testing in times of of difficulty in times of doubt um Nobody asked me, but that's the sermon I think I would try to preach this week if I was um, if I was if I was up on Sunday. I appreciate that, Matt. Um, the line that stood out for me this time is um, the same Lord is Lord of all. That communal sense that who else is on this uh, Lenten journey with us? Not just the people in my congregation or my denomination or community, but all of us who are making this journey to the cross um, and, and God is the same God, Jesus is the same Lord. And, and that's the journey we are on communally together. Um, and, and, and so that, that's where it began to, um, to resonate for me, but I really also appreciate your naming it. And I would, I would also say the possibility is to put it in its context of uh, the first century Roman community, which was hearing this not as, oh yeah, I know what that means. This is the promise that we have, but they were hearing it for the first time up against their divisions, up against uh, the reality of the moment that they were living in. And so maybe if, if, uh, if you're, you know, wanting to touch back in Romans and that's what you've done before and here's an opportunity to dive into it again is to remember to put this text as a first hearing back in that community in the first century as opposed to the familiarity that we have of something we quote all the time uh, as uh, as a standard for us so that's another way to approach it.